Right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's event, which is part of the New South Wales Reads program brought to you by the New South Wales Public Library Association. Um, if at any stage throughout today's events, you have a question for Leonard or myself, there is a Q&A option available and you can type in your answers and send them through to us. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which each of us are joining today. I pay my respects to the Aboriginal elders, both past and present, and extend those respects to other Aboriginal people as well. Today, I am joining from Warramai country, uh, but in my normal day life, I live and work in Wiradjuri country. So my name is Victoria and I work at Bathurst Library, and I'm really excited to be facilitating today's event. This panel discussion was inspired by New South Wales Reads book selection Luckies by Andrew Pippos, um, a debut novel that is set in part against the background of a chain of milk bars called Luckies. So what kind of memories do you have of milk bars? The ice cream, the milkshakes, the lollies, all the things you covet when you're a kid. Uh, let's talk about it. Today we are joined by um, Leonard Janaszewski, historian and co-author of Greek Cafes and Milk Bars of Australia. Um, our second panellist today, Barbara Godfrey, who is the director of Paris Milk Bar in Caring Bar, was unfortunately not able to join us today. But welcome, Leonard. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here, Victoria. Great to have you along. And I'm sure that this is going to be a fascinating discussion with lots of nostalgic memories popping up from the audience. So we're going to get straight back into it. Fantastic. And hello, everybody. <laughs> All right. So, Leonard, you are the author or co-author, I should say, along with Effie Alexis. Alexius, I think I, yep, I hope I pronounced that right. Like darkest. It's fine. <laughs> there you go. Um, of the book Greek Cafes and Milk Bars in Australia. Can you tell us about your book and what inspired you to compile this? Okay. Essentially, Effie and myself have been researching uh, the Greek Australian presence internationally since 1982. And as I usually say, we've grown old doing it. But what we were interested in uh, was the fact that this was a diasporic people. And a diasporic people take ideas and experiences with them wherever they travel, either in terms of the immediate family, that particular generation, or across generations. And when they travel, they transfer these experiences, transfer these ideas, and then they transform the host societies that they're in. And these ideas are mutated, okay? Transference, transformation, mutation. And there's also knock-on effects. It doesn't remain in one place. Ideas, no, no boundaries. They go across uh, continents. They go across oceans. And so what we were particularly interested in uh, was the Americanization aspect because Greeks were not simply coming from Greece itself, but also from other areas on the globe and particularly the U.S., and when, with them, when they came from the US, they brought ideas about food catering. And we were interested in this primarily because when we're interviewing a variety of people, and we have been since the early 1980s, the Americanization aspect started to crop up more and more during the oral history conversations that we had. Yet we hadn't focused in on that in terms of the original documentation within archives and in terms of secondary sources. So it was something new. And then we also... Got, went back to old photographs and we started noticing signs on windows, American ice cream, American chocolates. Why were they important? And so that area in terms of food catering became significant for us. And we wanted to go as far in depth as possible to see how these Greeks had started to transform Australian society in regard to food culture. But it got even better because not only were they influential in transforming food culture in terms of Americanization, but all the add-ons, not only in regard to American style ice cream, American style um, chocolates and so on, but they also brought across with them the ideas of fantasy in terms of the type of architecture, art deco architecture, American style art deco, which was known as streamline modern, curvilinear, okay? The relationship between the fantasy of cinema and eating habits so that milk bars would be established right next to cinemas or in cinemas. And we still have that concept today so that you would be reliving the fantasy of what you saw generally during the 30s, 40s and 50s American films and you would be enjoying it within an environment that reflected that. You then became part of the fantasy. So that's what we wanted to investigate. That's why we went into this particular research and of course, there were years before we brought the book out. There were various academic articles that we wrote. And we also had to do the work ourselves because you can't find this material in archival institutions en masse 
or in libraries en masse. You had to go out and listen to what people had to say. You had to copy their documents. You had to look at their old photographs and it all came together ultimately in terms of distributing this re-examination of our popular culture away from Great Britain towards the United States and looking at the Greeks as one of the focal points. Wow, there yeah. you go. <laughs> Seems like a big project. It was and it has been and it's continuing and there are other themes that we're looking at. For instance, at the moment, we're researching cafe wear and the aesthetic of cafe wear and how it fitted into this Americanization process, how it was part of selling an American dream, because the way in which something is designed reflects not only its pragmatic use, but the ideas that it wants to place into your head. And so that's a new area that we've developed. We've had one small exhibition on it, but now we're doing some in-depth research. Stay tuned for that one. <laughs> um, Leonard, in, in Luckies by Andrew Pippos, it features a Greek milk bar, which is based on a real milk bar, which is Andrew's family's milk bar. And this is in your book, Greek Milk Bars and Cafes in Australia. Can you talk about this a little bit? Sure. No problem whatsoever, because it was an amazing place. Uh, the milk bar that um, uh, Andrew is referring to in, in terms of having had the experiences was his uncle's milk bar, um, Angelo Pippos. Angelo and Margaret Pippos ran the Cafe Deluxe in Brewarrina, which is in northwestern New South Wales. Um, George Pippos, Andrew's father, uh, sorry, Angelo's father, he had about three cafes uh, in Queensland and in New South Wales prior to that. But in 1926, he established the Cafe Deluxe. And when Effie and myself first visited the Cafe Deluxe in 2002, we were blown away because everything that we had read to, to that date, all the information that we had heard in terms of oral histories and all the photographs that we had seen culminated in that visitation because it was, when it still existed, because unfortunately it burnt down in 2014, it was the best example in the nation of a Greek-run soda parlour. Okay. It was simply all there. The architecture was all there. The mirrored back bar made out of wood, even, even the signage, civility and cleanliness being emphasised. Even in terms of the confectionery counters were there. The booth seats were there. The crockery, the cutlery. Um, even the till, the original till was there. Everything was there. We actually walked into a, a, another time, another space. It was unbelievable for us. And... Um, we were lucky that Effie visually documented as much as we could, both internally and, and externally. Um, and the family, of course, was central to that particular um, commercial entity. They were, they, they were there nearly 24 hours a day. And Angela actually became the mayor of the town. And in the photograph that we have in the book, um, Andrew's father, Peter, is in there. OK, um, we've we've got Angelo with um, with with his brother and we were very fortunate to have been there during that stay um, over at the Cafe Deluxe in Brewarrina. Yeah, and I think that comes through in um, his descriptions that he uses in his book. Um, I certainly knew when I was reading it that I, I could picture it. And I think, like you're saying, that must come from that cafe. <laughs> oh, there are aspects within the book um, where I could see the Cafe Deluxe. <laughs> And he's also done a lot of background research because there's other, in, there's other incidents and instances where obviously he's had a look at uh, written documentation or he's gone back to original sources, either newspapers or personal letters and so on, um, which, are really, which was really striking and really authenticated the publication for myself and Effie in terms of the historical knowledge that has gone into it. Yeah, fantastic. I think that'd be something really worth listening to when um, he does his author talk with us next week. That'd be fantastic. I agree with you. Yeah. Um, so there was a time when the Lucky's restaurants in his book were associated with migrant culture, mostly Greeks immigrating after the Second World War and the Greek Civil War. Um, could you tell us about how Milk Bars first came about? Yeah, sure. Look, first of all, to begin with, um, there are milk bars, cafes, and soda Sunday parlours. I'll just give you a very brief history. And yes, whilst the majority of Greeks that uh, the general population would be aware of arrived after World War II and after the Civil War, Greeks have been arriving here since at least the 1810s. However, it wasn't until the first real wave of Greek migration during the gold rush period, 1850s through to the 1890s, 
that Greeks started entering food catering. Many had been to the Californian gold rushes of 1849, and they knew that if you wanted to dig, well, you could be lucky and strike it rich, but the majority didn't. However, because gold fields had been established where there were very few um, urban facilities, where do you get the food? Where do you get mining goods and so on? They established themselves in shops. And many of these shops were mixed businesses that also provided meals. So that's where it all started in terms of Greeks entering food catering. By the 1890s, they then went into soda parlors, but it was the back service soda parlor. It was in the back bar. So the proprietor would have their back to you. And these came out of apothecaries or early chemists. But what the Greeks did was those had experience in the United States by the time the front service soda fountain through technology had been developed, they swiftly brought those in en masse, which means that you engage with the public. And that's very important for Greeks because eating is not just simply um, a habit in order that you can continue to live, but it's a social occasion. It's an occasion to talk to people. And even if you're trying to sell something, you engage. So these front service soda fountains came in and there was one um, company in Sydney, the Anglo-American company that brought them in en masse. And even in Newcastle, which is where the first fr uh, front service soda fountains, Newcastle, New South Wales, where they came in, it started spreading. So within these soda fountains, they actually also brought in American style ice cream, which was very different to Australian um, made ice cream because it was incredibly sweet. It gave you love handles. It was bad for you. Mm, mm, I love being bad. It became very popular. So uh, drugstore soda parlor influence, Greek influence in terms of engagement when you're eating or trying to sell. American products in terms of them duplicating it. American style ice cream, chocolates. And those then eventually wound up in the cafes. Okay. But the milk bar itself in terms of the modern milk bar was an evolution out of those, particularly the drugstore soda um, parlor, but also the Galactopolion, which is a shop that sells only milk products in Greece. And the first modern milk bar was established in 1932 by a Greek who called himself Mick Adams, but his Greek name was Joachim Davalaridis. Now he established this during the depression. He'd been to the States. He had seen drugstore soda parlors in the United States. He had seen the Hamilton Beach milkshake maker, which was a milkshake whiz, okay? And he thought, gee, instead of having sit-down meals, instead of having desserts, instead of having pre-dinner drinks, why don't I just sell milkshakes and sodas? Remember, this is the depression years. And milk was being propagated as a health food. So he brought over these Hamilton Beach milkshake makers, established a premises um, in Martin Place in here in Sydney, and on the first day, 5,000 people entered. And it was seen as a phenomena. Within uh, the first um, week, there were 27,000 people who'd gone through. By 1937, there were 5,000 milk bars. Now that's not inclusive of cafes, refreshment rooms, and so on. 5,000 milk bars throughout the country. It had exploded because it was cheap. You only spent fourpence for it. Milkshakes had been around since the 1890s, but they weren't popularised and you didn't have the Hamilton Beach milkshake maker. You certainly did have um, various contraptions to try and mix the flavours in with uh, the uh, milk and the ice, but it didn't work and it wasn't popular. And uh, it just took off. And then that idea was taken into established cafes and so on, and it kept growing. So that's basically the history. But then of course, in terms of the contemporary with corporate fast food, these establishments had to compete. So they became takeaways or mixed businesses, but of course they couldn't compete. And there was also the seeds of its own destruction within it in terms of the succeeding generations became professionals. So that's all of that in a nutshell. Wow. Am I exhausting you? <laughs> that's a huge amount of success though in a very quick time, isn't it? Yes, very much so, um, particularly, in, particularly in, look, um, when Greeks entered into, into food catering, they knew that they could utilise the family. They didn't have to have a lot of English. 
and even their seafaring in terms of fishing and in and trade and in terms of agriculture actually gave them some understanding of food style and so on and how it had to be presented and their engagement in terms of the kafanir the social engagement also went into it so they were familiar with those things and they knew that they could get a foothold they didn't have to have they didn't have to become members of unions or anything like that they were on their own the family became the nucleus of their success mm. so in luckies there there are a couple of generations linked to the cafe mm. in varying roles so families were essential for the business families were crucial Chain migration fed um, either in terms of the immediate generation or succeeding generations fed these institutions because those institutions were feeding these families and those institutions were also giving these families an opportunity in terms of income to provide an education to the offspring. And the intent was not, generally speaking, for these offspring to go into the milk bars or into the cafes uh, once they came of age and once the earlier generation had ended their time at work, but to go on to bigger and better professional lifestyles in the host society. But it, the glue that held this all together was the family. If that wasn't there, it would be very, very difficult for it to have been undertaken. Yeah, interesting. Um, and just like in, in Lucky's, uh, our second panellist, Barbara, who was unable to join us tonight or today, um, she's the director of Parry's Milk Bar in Caring Bar, which is a, a conic retro style milk bar um, with a bit of a modern twist. Um, and Parry's was at one stage a chain. So can you, can you share with us, Leonard, a little bit about the history of Parry's? Yeah, sure. Uh, Paris actually derives from the Greek surname Panaretos, and it's Catherian. And the Panaretos clan initially established themselves the early part of the 20th century in the Waratah Cafe in Newtown, which was a significant cafe through which many Greek, particularly Catherian families, went through the early part of the 20th century. But at the end of the 1930s, beginning of the 1940s, uh, Avretos Paris, or Panaretos, went off and acquired uh, the Cogra uh, milk bar, which was the first one in this particular chain. They also, of course, um, acquired uh, Rockdale as well as Caring Bar. In Caring Bar, uh, that continued until I think, oh, the Casamatis took it over. And I think that was in 1969. The Cogra won, uh, sorry, the Caring Bar won Panaretos is established in 58. And by 69 or so, the Casamatis, who are also Catherians, took it over. And they were in there until I think about 2004. So it was long going. And then it was taken over by a succession of um, non-Greek proprietors. And it's continued. And its success has been primarily today in terms of the nostalgia hit that you get when you walk in. And yes, it does have that modern twist. So it does also attract a youth clientele, but also the station. We do know that when COVID hit, it was very difficult for them to generate ongoing business because of the fact people weren't catching trains. So its position was incredibly important. It was the first and last thing that you saw at that station. You go in, there's, there's Paris. Oh, I've had a hard day. Gee, I would like a sugar hit. What have we got there, confectionery? Oh, look at those terrific milkshakes. Oh, they're wonderful. So it has succeeded and it has remained and I wish them luck for the future because for me, it is the epitome of what milk bars were like. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we, have a, we have a comment here, actually, from one of our audience, Leonard, which kind of ties into the same kind of thing. Christos, he says, my father, forgive me for mispronunciation, my father, Constantine Karinges, opened the Embassy Cafe in Newcastle in 1942, which he sold in 1976 to Peter Douglas. It still operates as a cafe and has some of the original boots. Does this make it one of the oldest cafes in Australia that still operates? Look, I, it can't be the oldest. Uh, the reason for that is we still have, for instance, um, the Niagara Cafe, which is now up for sale. That's at Gundagai. That has been operating in terms of Greek run continually since 1902 when Stathi Nataris established it. It acquired the name the Niagara in 1919. 
um, and the Lukisas family are still operating it, although it is up for sale. However, in regard to the Karangis family, I'm very glad that you brought that up, Christos, because they are significant in terms of um, the establishment of popular food catering in Newcastle itself. Um, of course, uh, Karangis, um, the Karangis family has also been associated with the two Niagara cafes that had been established in Newcastle itself. And in actual fact, the first um, Niagara Cafe, which was established in the late, late 19th century, very early 20th century, um, it was one of the first to have a front service soda fountain. And the reason for that was because there was a coal trade, believe it or not, between Newcastle and California. So the Californians did not want to get their coal from the East Coast. The West Coast Californians wanted to get their coal from Newcastle. So there was an exchange going on because there was a large Greek migrant settler community in California that had gone into food catering. And many of them were from diverse areas of uh, Greece itself. And the ideas kept coming over. And so we got these um, cafes being established in Newcastle with these front service soda fountains. And the Karangis were brought out initially to go into the Niagara, okay? And then they established another Niagara and yes, uh, Con Karangis then went into the Embassy Cafe. And yes, it is still going and the son of uh, Douglas is now operating it. So it's, so it's one of the oldest, but not the oldest. I hope right, that answers Christos. your question, Christos, but I hope it continues going. <laughs> um, yeah, we hope that answers your question, Christos. If you want any more information, please type in some more. Um, we might talk a little bit now, Leonard, about how, how milk bars tend to be chains, chains of milk bars. Um, so Paris at one stage was a bit of a chain. And in Andrew's book, Lucky's, um, the franchise at its height was in more than 30 locations. So why do you think they proved to be so popular across, across the world? Okay, look, to begin with, yes, um, Andrew's quite correct. Chains did prove popular. By chains, it's not in the modern concept of franchise, all right? These were private treaties between one member of a family and generally another member of the family. The Commonos, for instance, established a chain, in inverted commas, of Commono cafes particularly here in New South Wales and in Southern Queensland. They were Cathereans and they're generally attributed um, to having developed en masse this idea of Greeks going into um, food catering, of course, although we know that um, prior to the early 20th century, prior to the 1890s, Greeks have been working in the um, gold fields in food catering establishments. Um, but even Mick Adams had this idea of a chain. He established the black and white milk bars, for instance, with um, family not only in Sydney, where there were two, there was one in uh, Melbourne, two in Adelaide, one in Brisbane, one in Wollongong. They became incredibly popular. It's where, again, this idea of transference and transformation, where the ideas were transferred to other members of the family or family friends, and then they established themselves in different areas to generate an income for their particular family members at that particular site. It was incredibly popular. But why the chains took off? Well, various reasons. Um, in the period prior to the popularization of the milk bar concept, where else did you go to eat? We didn't have um, pub, pub lunches. We didn't have RSL club that, that offered you dinners and so on. We didn't have the diversity of cuisines that we had today. And particularly if you wanted to go out in a country town and have a meal, where would you go? You would go to the Greek cafe. And even Russell Drysdale, who loved going out west here in New South Wales and southern Victoria, um, he had produced a series of works that focused on the significance of the Greek cafes, these country towns, although he referred to them as the Dagos. If you want something to eat, go across to the Dagos. And there's a famous painting of his, of West Wyalong, late in the evening. The entire street is dark, but at the end of the street, there's a light. And guess what that light is? Of course, we all know what it is. It's the Greek cafe. So he's emphasizing the significance. It's the only place where you can go and get a feed. And many of them, if they advertise themselves to be open for 24 hours, legally, they are obliged to do so. And because they brought in these new Americanisms, American style ice cream, American style chocolate, American style confectionery, and 
because when you went in them, given their architecture being American style art deco, you were living a part of America, you were taken away from your everyday cares. You were suddenly transformed to what was considered to be the leading Western culture of the time, the United States. So of course they became popular with the milk bar. Wow, it became incredibly popular because it was seen as a health food. Milkshakes were not what they are today. Um, because they were a health food, you didn't have ice cream in the original milkshakes. What you had was carob, and it could be because of the milkshake whizzes, it could be ground very smooth or you could have it crunchy for texture. Carob, honey, um, you could have nuts, you could have egg in it. And it was seen as an entire meal to the extent that the Australian Hoteliers Association was very upset because the men were leaving the pubs and going into the milk bars because they know that's where I can get a feed, not just a drink. And that continued right through until the 1960s, but then the decline started. So yes, um, chains were popular because the relationships between families and the enterprises were popular for the variety of reasons that I've outlined. But of course, there's, there's more. I've only got an hour. <laughs> So you talked a bit about the American influence, Leonard, and um, in your book, there's um, two cafes called California, one in mm. Wollongong and one in Ningen. Um, and in Lucky's, the character Achilles, he describes a cafe in Pitt Street called California as well. So you can obviously see that American kind of influence. And, and like you've talked about, it's the food and it's that kind of thing that, that makes it so popular. Yes, it is. And we also have to uh, place in here that there was a synergy that existed between these establishments and the picture theatres. Very important. And some cafes and milk bars had licences for those people who can remember the chocolate and confectionery ladies or boys going down the aisles selling you their items. That synergy was significant because when you were in the movies, you were totally transferred away from your everyday cares. And it was this fantasy aspect that you carried with you when you went out at interval. The young people wouldn't know what interval was, but there was an interval between the original short and then the main feature. And you would go across to the cafe, which was usually next door or across the street, and you would enjoy that fantasy. It will continue that you were looking at an American film, you were looking at Art Deco features in that American film, and here you were, suddenly you were in that film, you were in that cafe, you were in that milk bar, enjoying what those screen idols were enjoying. And that synergy continued again until the 1960s, because at that stage, TV had started to challenge picture theatres. Picture theatres then were on the decline. So, yes, they were popular, again, for a variety of reasons through the American fantasy context. And they were obviously a place for, for families, everyone of any age, really, with the confectionery, the milkshakes, the feed, the cinema aspect as well. So the whole family really had a place to go there. Yes, yes, indeed, you are right. Um, the orientation was towards families, and that's a very important point because Eating in Australia prior to the Greeks getting involved in food coming was structured according to your social rank or strata. So if you were well to do and you had enough dough, you would go off to a French restaurant and entertain yourself. If, if you were part of the working class, blue collar, you would go off to um, uh, something which was similar to a, to a pub, an oyster saloon. And you would consume alcohol, you'd have something to drink, fresh oysters, uh, uh, cooked oysters, pickled oysters, and it was usually only for men. What the Greeks did, again, given their background of popular eating within Greece, families were inclusive here. And that continued until, until, uh, with the introduction by Greek cafes and milk bars of jukeboxes en masse, particularly during the war where you had swing jazz music, and then later on, the introduction of rock and roll. Rock and roll was first heard in these Greek run establishments long before it's except on popular radio. Okay. So you would go in there and you would listen to popular music. However, during the late 1950s, rock and roll was contentious and members of our society frowned upon it. And this is where you had your bodgies and your widgies. And there may be some amongst our audience who are listening to this. And occasionally you would have a situation whereby a milk bar proprietor or a cafe proprietor would have to say, hang on a minute, I'm losing my family clientele, my takings are going down, I've got these bodgies and widgies, 
who do have a limited disposable income. They're always playing the jukebox, but they're not buying across all of the items I have. They're only buying sundaes or milkshakes. This isn't good and people are avoiding me. And then they would get rid of the jukebox. But there were those that persisted with the jukebox, but only focusing on the bodgies and widgies. So yes, you are right family orientation to begin with and again it was something which I indicated the Greeks had really focused on but later on there were changes in that due to the changes of our society and um, the income that was being generated through bodgies and widgies. When you describe it like that it reminds me a bit of well the first thing I think of is the movie Greece. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, there's another interesting point here, if I could digress briefly. A lot of people would have seen um, Happy Days, which was a TV um, uh, um, soap. Uh, well, I don't know if uh, soap's the correct term. It was a series that was on television, okay, with Ron Howard being one of the main characters and the Fonz. And we see them drinking milkshakes. The irony here in this is that milkshakes were not popular in the United States in terms of en masse until after World War II. They were incredibly popular here in Australia, which generated the first modern milk bar that then went global and did try to get in the United States, but couldn't because bars were seen as alcoholic in the United States. But what had happened, um, we had about 146,000 American troops out here and they went to these milk bars and cafes and they saw them being part of a little piece of America because they were based on the drugstore soda parlors. That was what they were based on. But milkshakes were popular, less so sodas. In the United States, it was the drugstore soda parlor and their sodas that were popular. So when these troops went back, many of them secreting um, the um, milk bars menu with all the types of milkshakes that, that they had, they would be asking for this. And we've seen statistically that there was a rise of milk consumption in the United States, in these establishments, in these drugstore soda parlors, in, in the US and their derivatives in terms of diners and so on that uh, developed. And it, but it got better because many of these Americans also married um, Australian ladies who then went over and also were familiar with the milkshake and they also wanted to have a drink. So what you see in happy days actually has an Australian connection in terms of the milkshake. There you go. <laughs> pile of nothing, right? Okay. <laughs> That's really interesting, actually. I'm sure many in the audience um, would find that interesting to know the influence we've had on that kind of style in America. Yeah, as I said, ideas know no boundaries. They simply keep crossing, transferring, <laughs> transforming, mutating. <laughs> Mutating, absolutely. So you've spoken a bit about the kind of milkshakes that these cafes had available. Um, in Andrew's book, Lucky's, he mentions some of the items available in that cafe franchise, such as the mixed grill, but never Greek food. Can you tell us, was that something that happened? Was the Greek food not on the menu? Generally speaking, no. Um, it was frowned upon. It was seen as, to use a derogatory term, to use this, to use this phrase in a derogatory term, peasant food. Um, British Australians were used to having their um, uh, meat and veg, having their mixed grills, their um, bacon, their, their um, sausage and so on, um, their steaks with eggs. That's what they were used to. Uh, cuisine that was agricultural based in terms of um, what you would, uh, in terms of growing vegetables and so on. Well, no, 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 that isn't what we eat. No, 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 no. Wouldn't do that. Um, Many farmers, for instance, who we've interviewed, because we not only interview those who ran cafes or those who worked in them, but also those who went into these establishments, um, they saw Greeks gathering weeds on the side of the road in that, uh, near country towns, and they were dandelions. And what are you doing? Oh, that's hot. Um, uh, we cook it. We, we put lemon juice on it. We put some salt on it. And it's very good for you. That isn't what they were interested in. However, there were some Greek cafes and milk bars that attempted to introduce Greek style food items. For instance, the Paragon Cafe, the famous Paragon at Katoomba, which is now closed. It was closed since 2017. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, um, Zachariah attempted to introduce um, Greek sweets, such as baklava, for instance, in a limited fashion, 
but he still persisted with it. But it wasn't incredibly popular. What was popular were the American style sweets that they were, and chocolates that they were manufacturing. In Darwin, for instance, if we go up there, the Continental Milk Bar that was established after World War II, milk bars have been established in Darwin prior to that, but um, the Darwin population was evacuated because of the war when the Continental Milk Bar was established. Um, and this was established by the Manolis family. Um, Nellie Manolis, who was a Paspale, connected to the Paspa famous Paspale Pearl family, um, she started producing kefteres, which are Greek style milk uh, and meatballs. They proved incredibly popular, but of course, they had somewhat, in terms of their, their meat content, a similarity to what British Australians were familiar with, but they persisted again and they actually took off over there. So, yes, whilst by and large, you did have British style meals that were still being provided. You did have attempts at introducing aspects of uh, traditional Greek cuisine. Okay, um, there was also a cultural, uh, maybe I should, I should call it a cultural uh, cringe. Um, there was a sense of superiority by British Australians in terms of their whiteness and their white culture, and Greeks were not seen as part of that. They were certainly very popular in terms of their commercial abilities and food catering, but culturally they were different. And remember, food is part of culture. So you don't, as far as British Australians, a generalisation here were concerned, they wanted to continue eating what they were familiar with, which they thought was part of a, a society and a culture which was buoyant, rather than a society and culture which they deemed to be peasant. This is getting into white Australia territory here. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have a question here from Antoinette Leonard. You may be able to shed some light. Um, she talks, well, earlier when we were talking about how in country towns, the Greek cafes may be the only place to get a feed. Mm -hmm. Antoinette asks, in country areas, what about getting a meal at a Chinese restaurant? Was there any kind of competing, com com competition? All Chinese kind of restaurants thing? came later. OK, in terms of I'm not talking about Chinese establishments that were specifically established for the Chinese. In fact, some research has been done on this, but Chinese establishments that were directed towards the broader popular audience. That certainly was a manifestation of the 1960s and 1970s when our cuisines started to uh, diversify. The reason for that was we started travel. We started to catch planes. We started going overseas. We, we took off our blinkers in terms of our cultural myopia and saw that cuisine could be much broader than what, we're, what we were used to. Um, yes, there was competition. And I'll also tell you this, that if you go to Victoria, and damn, I've forgotten the, the uh, town, but in one of the northern Victorian towns, there was a Greek cafe um, run by a Greek family that converted itself because of the competition into a Chinese cafe called uh, uh, the Dragon Cafe. And I wish I could remember the town, but here we have, again, transformations taking place. They saw that the Greek cafe was on the downward slide, but they saw that the Chinese restaurants were on the upward movement. So they transformed themselves from Greek cafe into Chinese restaurant. But yes, she is right. There was competition because there was friction when the diversification of popular eating cuisine started coming in. There you go. Fascinating time of history, I can imagine. Um, we have another question. We have quite a few questions coming through, Leonard. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, this one's from Steve. Uh, I grew up in a milk bar in Western Sydney where we had a soda fountain, confectionery bar and hamburgers plus mixed grills. From the late 40s to late 60s, were the Greek cafe milk bars the primary introducer of hamburgers to Australia? Okay. My argument would be to push it towards the Greeks, yes, because we do have, again, it's an American influence, Okay, it's not, it wasn't generated within Australia, although we've had our add-ons, of course, in terms of beetroot and in terms of pineapples. And there's been various books written about the history of a hamburger and what is a hamburger. And it even goes back to Mongolia, the Mongolian plains, in terms of how a meat patty was established. But generally speaking, when we take a look at the archival record, we can find that from the late 1920s onwards, the idea of hamburger or as they were advertised then super american hamburgers and then an explanation of what they were were being advertised by particular greek run cafes okay that's the earliest that we have that instance in terms of 
documented evidence, late 1920s onwards. So I cannot, I cannot locate at this present time a reference in a British Australian establishment, and there were British Australian refreshment rooms and so on, um, that, that indicate that they had hamburgers. It was the, these were ideas that were coming direct from the United States and our relationship to the US in terms of popular eating seems to have resonated through the Greek experience of the US. And remember, the Greeks, not simply those coming here, but they would be constantly writing to one another or when they had um, cable across the Pacific, talking to one another about what things were happening, what was new and so on. And I would argue at the present time, until I find something else or until anyone out there knows of further information that the Greeks were instrumental with the introduction of the hamburger from the 1920s onwards, late 1920s. And Peter here has a similar kind of question. What about the Greek fish and chip shops? Where do they fit in and are there family ties to the cafes there? Yeah, there are. Look, fish and chip shops have been around in terms of um, Scottish and even Irish involvement uh, from uh, the 1850s onwards. There's evidence of these type of establishments and they were particularly popular during the 1880s and the 1890s. And in actual fact, the Comino's, that um, family that established the early chains of soda parlours within New South Wales and southern Queensland. Um, um, John and Athanasius Comino are, are connected to having seen or at least John is, um, sorry, Ath um, Athanasios is, in terms of having seen um, a fish and chip shop and have taken and, and took it over, a fish and chip shop that I think was being run by a Welshman in um, Paddington in, in Sydney. And in actual fact, that establishment was, was on the same site that a Greek fishmonger had prior to the fish and chip shop, but then thought, oh, that's a good area to go into. So they established themselves in that, but slowly they started getting the idea of having soda parlours and having a soda fountain within it and providing a diversity of meals, not just simply fish and chips. But that tradition is a British European tradition, which the Greeks did engage with to begin with, to get a foot in, particularly in the very early part of the 20th century. But then they started diversifying, given the ideas and experiences that they had, particularly from the United States and their own ex cultural experiences from Greece. But yes, and there has been some individuals who have tried to do some research with fish and chips uh, shops. And there's a book that has come out um, recently called A Wog in a Fish Shop. Um, the author's name, uh, it's not Leonidas, but it's recently brought out. And if you Google A Wog in a Fish Shop, you'll be able to get the experiences of an individual growing up in a fish and chip shop in, I think it's the 60s. Um, but more research has to be done on that. More research has to be done. And we have a question, Leonard, from Suma. Why are they called milk bars? Why not milkshake bar or ice cream bar? Ooh, um, very yeah. good one. Yes, <laughs> love, love it, love it, love it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> earlier on, I'd mentioned in terms of the development of the milk bar, the Galacto Polion, okay, which in Greece is a milk shop, okay? Now, Let's take a look at what was here. Soda parlors were also known as soda bars. So gala is milk in Greece. So let's put that together. Milk and soda parlors, milk bar. Okay, soda parlors or soda bars, bar at the end, milk. That's how that name started, started to develop. Okay, milk was also utilized as a reference to a light refreshment, not an alcoholic beverage, not an alcoholic beverage. Um, 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 establishment. The term milk bar actually existed before its commercialization through the popularization of milk bars um, in terms of the concept that uh, Mick Adams or Joachim Tavalaridis had. Um, if people sometimes they even referred to soda parlors as milk bars, okay, generally speaking, even before the modern milk bar concept had been established. But it was a generalization in terms of, yeah, this place sells light refreshments not alcoholic beverages. But for me, it's the marriage between the uh, milk shop concept, the Galactopoleon in Greece itself, um, with the drug store, uh, sorry, with the soda parlor or soda bar that had been established here, bringing those two things together, marrying them. Wonderful. 
Gosh, we've got so many questions. It's really great to see all these wonderful questions. Um, Leonard, I might ask you, what, um, what are some of the factors contributing to the demise of milk bars? They're multiple, absolutely multiple. And I made reference to them um, somewhat earlier. But to begin with, these establishments were not for, generally speaking, the second or third generations. These establishments were there for the foundation of the family, the, the foothold within the new host society, and a foothold within the education system to give them the material means to go to good schools and so on, and become professionals. And so as a second generation did enter the workforce, they didn't go, generally speaking, into these establishments. They went into um, professional fields. They became the stereotypes of the 1970s, 1980s and 1990s. Hey, I've got a Greek accountant. I've got a Greek doctor and so on. Okay, I've got a Greek lawyer. Also, economically, we were changing. Uh, I made reference to the theatres that, um, that had a synergy, a working relationship with uh, milk bars and cafes. The picture theatres were challenged during the 1960s um, by TV. Many of them closed. So you're losing that clientele. You had the mechanisation of um, agriculture within rural districts. Population was being lost. Train lines were going. And so you wouldn't get the tourist trade. The idea of actually having a tour, a country tour, started to disappear because it became focused on getting from point A to point B. Oh, I've got to go interstate. I'll fly. Oh, I've got to go to Cobar. Oh, I've got to go to Shepparton. I'll just fly. Okay. So you'd be missing out on those towns and on those cafes and on those milk bars. You also had the introduction of corporatized fast food, particularly from the United States. And most people are today, and this is and the evolution, the Greek cafes, these were part of the seeds of their own destruction in terms of establishing this idea of takeaway, the milk bar in, in particular. Um, you had corporatized fast food, such as uh, KFC, Kentucky Chicken. They don't want to know that it's got fat in there bad for you. Um, uh, McDonald's, uh, Hungry Jack's, Burger King, Pizza Hut, all of those kept flooding in. Of course, this had corporate financial strength and corporate, corporate distribution strength. How's the individual family going to compete with that? You also had in terms of the ice creams and milkshakes, the milkshakes, for instance, you know, had flavoured milk. You want a milkshake? Shake it up. There you go. Take it away rather than going and creating it over at the Hamilton Be with a Hamilton Beach milkshake maker. If you want an ice cream, packaged ice creams, go off to the supermarket. Flavoured milk's also at the supermarket. Chocolates, biggest time for Greek cafes and milk bars. Easter, for instance, or Mother's Day. You would see all these chocolates at the back counter filling up. It was a colourful, colourful um, perception for people who came in to see these vibrant colours, all gone because they've now gone off to the supermarket. Okay? You had those sorts of challenges. Even the idea of cars, for instance, for those who did travel by car, larger engines, you'd bypass towns. Freeways uh, were being built to bypass towns. So again, population and clientele were starting to decline. So if you put a variety of those things together, how could these institutions survive? To begin with, they started to transform into takeaways. So as I mentioned earlier, the kitchens out the back disappeared. You then had the fries in the front. They then attempted to diversify. This forced diversification within their items, not just simply mixed grills. You would have souvlaki. You would have barbecue chicken. You would have, for instance, rissoles. You'd have a variety of things that they didn't have before, but it wasn't enough. There were too many things which were opposing the continuation of the Greek milk bar and cafe as they existed. However, you did have the evolution that took place because the platform for your corporate fast food had been derived through these establishments, okay? It set the groundwork for them in terms of popular eating. So do you think that they are making a comeback? Whoa. Big question. Making a comeback? Yeah, it is a good question. In those areas that have a captured tourist clientele, and have very limited um, corporate fast foods. Certainly, um, some have remained, some traditional Greek cafes um, or milk bars have remained. And of course, not with Greek proprietors. And when we look at, when I talk about Greek milk bars, it's not simply the idea, oh, these were run by Greeks. It's the ideas of economically how these businesses should be run that I'm talking about, okay? 
Um, some of them have survived, such as, for instance, um, the Golden Gate over at the entrance uh, in, on the central coast of New South Wales. You had others where nostalgia milk bars had been attempted to be established, such as the um, Parthenon milk bar in Tamworth. Bridget Attard and her ex-husband attempted to establish that, but it only lasted two or three years. Uh, you, you didn't have the type of client, youth clientele that they previously had. And again, the um, Peters Cafe over at the Roxy, there have been three proprietors so far. The Roxy is a theatre complex at Bingara. Three proprietors have been through there so far. They don't get the tourist trade and they don't have the local trade that they need to survive as an economic entity. Um, these things can't simply exist on nostalgia. There has to be a sustainable economic package of ongoing income to maintain these places. Um, but certainly there are some Greek cafes, traditional Greek cafes and milk bars that have continued to exist. And I mentioned some of them earlier. And there, and there have been attempts to establish nostalgia outlets. But from the experiences that I have seen so far of the proprietors, it's very, very difficult. They have to have something going in their direction and particularly not having competition from the corporates or providing something to the local community, either in terms of ongoing identity or a particular type of product, which isn't felt elsewhere, by which they can see sustainability at least during their proprietorship of that business. But very difficult. Yeah, uh, of course, if there are any out there, Monica, who, uh, Victoria, sorry, who, um, who are running these establishments, um, my congratulations to you because it is incredibly difficult. Sorry, Victoria. No, you're right. Um, we have a, quite a few people here um, commenting and asking about the Olympia Cafe on Parramatta Road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, someone here says the end of the milk bar makes me think of the sad demise of the Olympia bar. Um, and the owner, one of two brothers, the last man standing and then closure, um, which is sad end, but similar to the, the character Achilles in the Lucky's book too, which is a good observation. Yeah. Oh, yeah, very, very much so. Yeah. Um, yes, Nicholas Fotti is still in there and that individual may know that he still sits in the Olympia Milk Bar, even though it's shut, um, as if he's waiting for customers to come in. Look, there is a, a socio-cultural issue here in terms of, it's not just simply a business for these families. Um, it's been a lifetime experience, something which you just can't let go of when you shut the door. Now, he's been, Nicholas and his brother, John, Nicholas arrived out in Australia in 1955. He originally went to the Silver Key in Wagga and then went across uh, with his brother to the Olympia and they purchased the Olympia in the late 1950s, very early 1960s. They also at one stage were looking at uh, buying the um, deluxe picture theatre that had been transformed into a roller skating rink right next to them, but there were issues and there were problems. Um, he's lived his entire life in this country from 1955 to today in these establishments. You can't simply say, let's lock up shop, buy, uh, it's a health hazard, can't be fixed. Um, what do you do in these situations? Is there a social responsibility that we collectively as a community have? I've got my answer for that. I don't know what others have. I know what council considers. Sorry, we can't, they can't operate because of the fact that it's a health problem. He has to fix it up. Um, it's an it's a impasse, what's going to happen there. Um, and Nicholas is a very private individual. He does not want to have assistance. He wants to keep to himself. That's, that's, an, that's another issue. But yes, it's, it, it, it was established at the Milk Bar in 1939. If those, of, those who've been in there recognise that the original features are still behind the facade of planks, which Nicholas has put up, it originally had booth seating. There's terrazzo entrance on, in terms of the floor tiles when you go in. And because it was established in 1939 as a milk bar, you will see how long the bar is and it has island bars. So that because the distance between the back bar and the, um, and the front bar was so small, you had to know what people wanted. So, I, so in the original back bar, it said Sundays, sodas, milkshakes. So when people lined up, they knew to line up there to get these items and a very small confectionery sense, uh, section because the original milk bars did not have confectionery. It was only sodas, and Sundays, 
confectionery started coming in, once your concentric circles of milk bars out of, for instance, the Sydney Centre started growing, you started adding different items to it. And that's where the Olympia comes in. You can see this small confectionery counter in the front. But for those who are not aware of it, go and take a look at it before it absolutely goes and it's lost in time. Sounds like an amazing building then. It's dilapidated, but people can see what it originally was. Yeah. Um, we have another question here from Nikki. Can you give me any information of my father's milk bar called the Corinthia Cafe in Grenfell? Funny that, <laughs> because we um, gave a presentation in Grenfell. And in actual fact, we acquired the signage um, of that cafe uh, which we have in our in our archival collection. What I mean by signage is signage um, uh, that that um, oh gee, I'm forgetting my terms. Okay, everybody, what's the signage where you have the lights on it? Um, neon lights. Oh, I'm getting old. Um, the original neon lights. Of course, the neon lights aren't there, but the metal backing is. Um, in terms of the actual history of that cafe, I would have to go back to notes. I'd have to go back to research, but that's the first thing that pops into my head. Yes, we do have the original um, signage. And if she goes to a Facebook site called Greek Milk Bars and Cafes of Australia, and she takes a look at a display that we had at the Australian History Museum at Macquarie University, she will see that sign. She'll see what it looks like. Fantastic. There you go. We'll have to look that up on Facebook. Um, another one here from Annetta. Are you familiar with the Acropolis Milk Bar Cafe that opened in Gunnada in the late 1940s? Yes, indeed. In fact, the building, uh, the building is still there. And at the top, it states Acropolis. And there's still crockery that's available at the local historical society. Um, I'm forgetting names. Um, but the Acropolis Cafe originally started out as a different cafe that belonged to, again, the Panaretos clan, okay? Um, they established it late 19th century, early 20th century, and the, um, I forgot the name of the cafe, I forgot the name of the family that uh, created the name, the, the Acropolis, but they took over the existing establishment from them and then built uh, the Acropolis Cafe itself, okay? Uh, again, I'd have to go back to notes and so on because there are hundreds of thousands of these establishments, but it was a very popular time and there are images of it that exist. Some of them are actually on the web. Others are within the historical, the local historical society. Um, she, she's probably done that already. <coughs> but if she hasn't, that's, that's what you'd do. And also if she goes to Trove and checks out the newspapers because there were various ads that were placed in for cafe staff who were usually... British Australian women. Brilliant. I'm impressed by your memory, Leonard. <laughs> I've got a bad memory, believe me. <laughs> uh, we have a question here from Keith. For someone overseas visiting Sydney, what's the one milk bale they should visit? The Olympia. It's closed, um, but I know that um, on, on occasion, if you knock on the door, uh, Mr. Um, Fotiu will let you in, but it's not operating, okay? You'd just be there as a visitor. Um, of course, Parry's, you've got to go to Parry's because that's still operating and you still get the hit of nostalgia. But of course, you also have the modern twist in terms of what's available. And they have modern milkshakes, um, which have been created as a mix of pastry sundaes and milkshakes. Now, they are incredibly bad for you. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Parry's, but they are. Look at, look at me. I love milkshakes and I've gained love handles and a little tummy, so I'm told, because of it. <laughs> Um, yeah, do go to Parry's. Uh, if you uh, want to go elsewhere, you could go out to Katoomba. The Paragon is closed, but there are other cafes um, that are still operating. There's a new Paragon cafe that has been established across the road, and you'll get a little bit of a hit in terms of what they provide in a regard to traditional um, refreshments that you get at these establishments. Um, oh, gee, where else? The Pacific one's gone. Um, if I was this gentleman, I'd also take a road trip, uh, go down the, to the Niagara at Gundagai. Um, there's also the White Rose at Tamora, the White Rose, I think, or is it the Red Rose at uh, Dunny Do? There's still some which are around and certainly go up to Bingara and um, get, get the full hit 
of what the cafe theatre synergy was all about. And as I said, there's a little cafe museum up there. Um, so don't limit just to Sydney, but these things are dying, absolutely dying. But uh, you're right, Paris um, would be a fantastic one to see with that retro kind of twist to it. And if you're mm. just after a photo, Paris does have a Facebook page as well. So you can look it up to see what some of their um, current inside interior looks like as well. And, of course, Newcastle um, with the Embassy Cafe, with uh, the Douglas family that's, that's still operating it. And even though that's been refurbished in a continental style, it still provides you with an understanding of, in terms of booth seats and so on, of what these places look like. Well, Leonard, we're almost out of time, but I want to know, what is your favourite memory of Milk Bar? My memory, it's actually not my memory. Um, one of the things that um, it brought me back to was looking at my own family, and no, I'm not Greek, and um, although some people think that I am, but I'm not. Uh, my father and mother uh, went to the Palatial Picture Theatre in Burwood, uh, which is an inner western suburb of Sydney. And that's where they had their first date. And there was a milk bar that was part of that complex. And that's where they enjoyed milkshakes and sundaes. That was, of course, before I was born. But then when I was living in Burwood growing up as a very young boy, I remember going to that picture theatre and watching A Hard Day's Night and so on but also going to that milk bar and thinking, what was it like for my parents when they were on their first date mm -hmm. in this particular milk bar? So it was a bit of nostalgia, but a memory that wasn't mine. It was my parents, um, but one which I wanted to try and recreate by sitting there myself and considering it. Um, so I was ordering quite a lot of milkshakes and that's when, my, uh, when the demon hit me, gaining weight. <laughs> and what's your favourite milkshake? chocolate without anything else plain Just chocolate, chocolate. Yeah. there you go <laughs> we have one more question here um from Gannett. uh may i ask whether the adronicus family was in any way connected to such milk bars was there some connection with coffee yes there is a connection with coffee the Andronicus's, the Andronicus brothers had established themselves um in in sydney and they established two premises um, in Sydney, but the last one was near Circular Quay on George Street, and they were instrumental in the development of um, espresso coffee culture here within Australia. They were not the first to introduce the espresso machine in Sydney. In fact, another Greek did that by the name of Sam Acon in 1948-49 in his Patricia's Milk Bar that was in um, one of his Patricia's Milk Bars that was in Wynyard. And that was well before the establishment. I'm looking at the broader public, not just espresso coffee for Italians and um, all Greeks, um, but espresso coffee for the broader public. That was he has, Acon established in 1948 here, well before the um, Melbourne ones had been established. But yes, they had an espresso machine um, during the early 1960s in their establishment. And in actual fact, in the next volume that we're bringing out, there's two of them, um, we're going to have a detailed... Um, insight into the Andronicus family and one of the sons of um, the original Andronicus family um, still has, still operates a coffee shop in um, one of the Sydney, one of the northern Sydney suburbs um, and does it very well, thank you. And of course, here comes my bad memory. I've forgotten which suburb it is. Uh, there was a stage where one of the Andronicus brothers, and this was uh, during, the, during the 1930s, established a milk bar in Sydney itself because they saw how popular milk bars were, but it was to diversify um, their uh, the business's uh, economic basis because depression years, decline in business, they opened up wholesaling ev even more, but they thought let's open up this other arm because milkshakes were so popular. And they established one in Martin Place or near Martin Place, and I've forgotten the, the, the uh, name, and that went on for quite a number of years. So, yes, they were connected to that particular milk bar. Fantastic. I'm sure we could be here for hours talking about all these different kind of milk bars and connections. It's fascinating. Do we, do we stay? Can we stay? <laughs> 
I would I think anyone who has an interest in this or would like to visit some of those memories and those places that they've come across in their own lives to really pick up a copy of um, Leonard and Effie's book Greek Cafes in Milk Bars of Australia from your local library or your local bookshop um, and flick through it it's got some beautiful images in there from past um, there's the Paris a present picture in there as well so I really encourage anyone who has an interest to go ahead and pick up a copy of that um, but we have run out of time so thank you Leonard thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your experience and some of your work with us thank you Victoria for guiding all of this and taking care of it <laughs> and suggesting it to begin with not a worry. It's it's fascinating to look at um, Andrew Pippos's book Luckies and go back to the the historical kind of aspect from your book and see how they relate and how they match up. So, yep, wonderful to hear. Um, and we've got so many comments and thank yous coming through on the Q and A, Leonard. Um, many people have already picked up a copy of your book and they're loving it. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Seriously, Victoria, thank you to yourself and Monique for doing such a great job. We really do appreciate it. You're featuring an aspect of, of Australian society and history and culture, um, which is very little talked about. Uh, but I'm hoping now with um, Lucky's being out there and with that other book that I referred to in terms of fish and ship shops, that we will see more of this because those individuals who really um, experience this at, their, at its height, uh, during um, the period prior to the 1960s, they're very few and far between. And Australian society has changed so much. The way we eat has changed so much. We mustn't forget um, what happened prior to the present. And this is one way of celebrating it and uh, getting engaged with what went before. Yeah, absolutely. Important things that we, we should try and remember, isn't it? Mm. Um, if you're looking for where to find the book, there is some link in the chat box for where you can try and source um, Lennon's book from. Um, if you're going to wanting to watch this recording again, the recording will be available on YouTube in the coming days. Um, but otherwise, next week we have our author talk with Andrew Pippos himself on Wednesday the 17th. So don't forget to book in for that one as well. Um, Leonard, are you going to be watching that one? Oh, yeah. Unless, of course, <laughs> I'm dragged away to do something else. Yeah, more research maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, or, yeah or, or dealing with other issues. That you need. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining, and we will see you next. Thank you.